Hey, 42 here. In 1266, the monks of Saint Genevieve Monastery in France sentenced a criminal to death for the unimaginably horrific crime of murdering a child and eating the body. It seems to have been a cut and dried case. As far as we can tell, the condemned didn't dispute his sentence, although that might be because he was a pig. And no, I don't mean he was a nasty guy. I mean, an actual pig. What a swine. In a similar case in 1474, a rooster in the Swiss city of Basel was tried, convicted, and executed for the heinous and unnatural crime of laying an egg. The event was clearly the work of Satan, and as everyone knows, the eggs of satanic roosters can contain a cockatrice, a dragon-like creature with two legs. Not something you want running around the breakfast table. In the end, the bird was burnt alive and the body discarded, which was probably a good idea. If there's one thing I've learned in this life, it's that you should never eat Satan's cock, no matter how tasty it might look. These cases of capital punishment for animals might seem bizarre, but they are not historically unusual. Records going back to the 9th century reveal a long trend of humans putting animals on trial for bad behaviour. Culprits have included insects, slugs and snails, leeches, weevils, small mammals like mice and rats, big mammals like pigs and cows, birds, worms, and a monkey suspected of being a French spy. The number of these cases has gradually declined over the centuries, but it hasn't fallen to zero. In 1916, in Tennessee, a circus elephant named Mary was lynched for killing her handler, an untrained homeless man who, until 24 hours before, had never even seen an elephant. Great choice of a handler there. In 2004, in Kazakhstan, a female brown bear named Katya was sent to an actual human prison for 15 years after mauling two people. And as recently as 2008, a genuine court of law in Macedonia convicted a bear for stealing a beekeeper's honey. The case dragged on for a year whilst the beekeeper explained the trouble he had gone through to frighten the bear off with disco lights and high-tempo Serbian folk music. The bear, who clearly preferred drum and bass, didn't even have the courtesy to show up for the court proceedings, but managed to avoid punishment on grounds of being a protected species. To most people, the idea of sending an animal to prison or sentencing it to be burnt at the stake, even just putting it on trial, seems ridiculous. But these stories actually raise some tricky questions about how responsible we humans are for our own actions. You see, the reason animals across the vast majority of the civilized world are not routinely asked to plead guilty or not guilty to any crimes they may have committed is, quite simply, because they can't, and not just because they don't have the vocal cords to form the words. Most societies correctly consider animals to be unable to make moral decisions in the same way we humans do. The established thinking is that animals, even well-trained ones, are ultimately slaves to their instincts, acting out their urges without first passing those impulses through a filter of morality. Humans, on the other hand, are believed to be independent, free-thinking creatures, capable of making good moral judgments. Based on this belief, when we do make bad moral decisions, we usually risk some form of punishment at the hands of whoever's in charge. This view of the world relies on the assumption that each of us has free will, which means we have the freedom to choose our actions, even if those actions result in us sharing a prison cell with a large man named Nancy. But what if this view is wrong? What if we actually have no more free will than bears or pigs or weevils? This question has been bugging philosophers and legal theorists, but probably not bears, for thousands of years, and many regard it as unsolvable. Over the last few decades, neuroscience and quantum physics have chipped in with some useful insights, but the debate still rages. 
do humans truly have free will? And if they don't, what does that mean for how we operate as a society? If you do something morally wrong, is it completely your fault? How about if you do something amazing? Do you really deserve all the credit? You may be watching this thinking, what ridiculous questions. Of course I have control over my actions. How else could I be watching YouTube in my underwear? And that makes sense to most of us because it just feels right. The notion of free will, not your underwear. Every day we can point to numerous decisions seemingly made at our own discretion. I was hungry, I ate a sandwich. I was tired, I went to sleep. I was lonely, I remembered to obey the restraining order. Simple. Well, not if you agree with casual determinism. The belief that every event is fully decided by some cause that came before. That cause was caused by something, which in turn was caused by something else, and so on. In other words, there are no options or choices. There's just a never-ending chain of cause and effect, stretching all the way back to the origin of the universe. You may think you choose to have a sandwich for lunch, but that choice was determined by a collection of factors outside your conscious awareness that guaranteed your lunchtime BLT was inevitable. According to determinism, the impression that you had some independent role to play in how those events unfolded is nothing more than an illusion. Perhaps it's all orchestrated by a pompous guy who sits in a room full of TVs and likes to call himself the architect. It's the thinking behind the ancient Greek myth of the fates or the moirai, three goddesses who decide the destinies of mortals when they are born, weaving the individual threads of their lives into a tapestry of all humankind. Their power was so strong that not even Zeus himself could alter the course of history and he was basically their boss. Similar themes exist in Norse mythology, German paganism, Roman mythology, even Shakespeare's Macbeth. In Chinese myth and legend, an invisible red thread of fate connects the fingers of two people who are born to be together. Isn't that lovely? Most of the world's great religions also include a version of this view, in which God, or another form of all-knowing, all-powerful deity, has decided, or at least knows in advance, what is to happen across time. Fate continues to be a sticky idea, even in a secular world. Most people who regard themselves as agnostic or atheist have had at least one experience which seemed too amazing to have happened by chance, like it was just meant to be. But fate and determinism are not the same things. Strictly speaking, belief in destiny is a type of determinism called fatalism that says all events are mapped out in advance, usually by some form of higher power. The grand plan doesn't need to follow any laws of cause and effect, it just is. As if someone once made a movie about life across all of time and then pressed play. In ancient Greece, around the 7th century BC, the notion began to emerge that it was fundamental laws of nature, not the gods, that decided the events of our daily lives. Philosophers Democritus and his mentor Leucippus developed the idea that we're all made of atoms, and the motions of these atoms is decided purely by the natural laws of causation. In their view, the future was entirely determined by the past. As our understanding of the natural world and the laws that govern it expanded, determinism became increasingly informed by the emerging disciplines of science, and few people had a bigger impact on the development of modern determinism than Isaac Newton, the 17th century mathematician, astronomer, physicist, theologian, and all-around smart guy. When Newton developed his laws of motion and universal gravitation, he appeared to have uncovered the very rules that govern the universe, giving determinism a scientific foundation. With Newton's principles, it became, in theory, possible to accurately predict the results that would be caused by almost any action. 
In 1814, French scholar Pierre Simon Laplace, the first person to publish literature about casual determinism, took this to the next level with a thought experiment that became known as Laplace's Demon. Since classical physics explained every reaction in existence, Laplace reasoned we could theoretically understand the causes and effects that had led us to any point in time. We could also predict the future from that point in time onwards. So if there were some intelligence, let's call it a demon or a god or a giant turnip named Patrick, capable of knowing all the forces operating in the universe and the exact location of every particle in the universe, that intelligence would be able to explain everything that had happened in the past and predict everything that would happen in the future. And of course, there's not a lot of space for free will when every action is predictable and already set in motion. The viability of Laplace's turnip has since been undermined by the discovery of thermodynamic irreversibility, amongst other things, but the idea were ruled by cause and effect and by extension the implication we might not be as responsible for our own actions as we think we are, hasn't gone away. And in 1983, American physiologist Benjamin Libet conducted an experiment that rocked the scientific world by providing compelling evidence that we don't have free will. Labette was monitoring brain activity in individuals by carrying out a very simple action, tapping their fingers on a table. His aim was to study how signals in our brain turn into physical actions in the real world. But during the experiment, he noticed something strange. He was measuring brain activity before his test subjects reported having consciously decided to act. In other words, their brains were initiating finger movement before the subject had consciously made the decision to move. As far as Labette was concerned, this was neurological proof we are not masters of our actions. Our brains are making decisions before we're aware of them and somehow covering up the evidence. We think we're acting autonomously, but it's all a trick of the mind. It was a bad day for free will. The results of Labette's work became well known, for many ending the free will debate forever. But more recent research suggests the experiment may have been flawed in the first place, that the brain activity Labette was interpreting as the initiator of finger movement in his subjects might have been little more than background brain activity muddying his results. In 2012, neuroscientist Aaron Scherger re-ran Labette's experiments with a few tweaks accounting for this possibility and found that our brains might not be making sneaky decisions without us knowing about them after all. The game was back on for free will. Sugar's research has definitely not proved free will is a real thing, but it has forced a rethink of determinism. Well, of the hard variety at least. Hard determinism is the type we've been talking about up until now. The belief that free will and a deterministic universe are incompatible. It's one or the other. But soft determinism, usually referred to as compatibilism, is the view that free will and determinism can coexist. For compatibilists, this allows us to avoid simplifying the full complexity of human experience down to a series of physical laws, a process known as reductionism. It also opens up space for the uncertainty kicked up by quantum physics. Hard determinism has its roots in the laws of classical physics, but these rules don't apply at a quantum level, a rather inconvenient issue that happens to be one of the biggest unsolved problems in physics. Scientists have yet to find a theory of everything to explain the way the whole universe works, from the super big to the subatomic, and until then, they have to accept that the quantum world and the macro world mostly operates according to different laws. With all this in mind, the closest thing we can find to casual determinism at the quantum level are determined probabilities. For example, it may not be possible to predict the trajectory of a subatomic particle in the same way you can accurately predict the trajectory of a planet or a frisbee. 
But particles all obey determined predictabilities that give them a degree of predictability. Some people, including Einstein, argued there are hidden variables we simply can't see that would account for gaps in our ability to predict quantum behavior. And if we knew these, the universe would be fully deterministic. We could predict everything. But this is hotly debated by other physicists. Regardless of which side you take, quantum physics currently casts reasonable doubts on the idea of determinism. Basically, if the world around us is inherently unpredictable, true determinism can't exist. Of course, the big question is not, do you have free will, but rather, why should you care? Sure, most of us like to think we have free will, because we prefer to feel like we make our own choices. But if we are actually just highly sophisticated robots or puppets acting out the inevitable drama of a deterministic universe, what difference does that really make? We still feel like we make our own decisions, so everything ends up the same. Well, for one thing, it could alter how forgiving we are of each other's behavior. Take, for example, the case of Charles Whitman, a US Marine known as the infamous Texas Tower Sniper. On the 1st of August 1966, Whitman killed his mother and wife before heading to the University of Texas, where he proceeded to kill another 14 people and wound 31 before police shot him dead. It remains one of the most horrific shootings in American history. But a recent study questions whether Whitman was truly responsible for his actions. Doctors performing the autopsy on Whitman's body found a brain tumor pressing against his amygdala, a part of the brain critical to emotional regulation and behavioral control. Whitman was one of 17 cases involved in a study that looked at examples of criminal behavior committed by people with brain lesions. Even though the research subjects had brain lesions in different parts of their brains, the lesions were all found in places connected to a neurological system dubbed the Criminality Associated Network. This network is closely linked with brain structures related to moral judgment and decision making. And researchers believe disruptions to these brain systems could have been responsible for the individual's criminal behavior. This conclusion raises some difficult questions about free will and how responsible any of us are for our own decisions. If our actions can be influenced so significantly by events in our brains, how much choice do we really have in what we do? Where do we draw the line of moral and legal responsibility? In the end, is there really so much difference between us and honey stealing bears? Thanks for watching. You can get your hands on my book, Stick a Flag in It, over on Amazon or on Audible. Links to both in the description below. Thank you.